Good afternoon, everybody. And I should start by saying thank you very much to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak to you here today. My talk is entitled, A New Approach for Parameter Estimation in Complex Epidemiological Models. And I'll be discussing a variety of different inference methods, both from the literature and ones we've been developing over the two years since the start of the pandemic. Before I begin my talk, I just wanted to tell you a bit about my background prior to joining the RAMP Consortium. I actually did my degree in physics, somehow find myself working on genetics in the Rosalind Institute in Scotland, most famous for Dolly the Sheep, and finally now I'm working in Biomathematics and Statistics Scotland in Edinburgh. Part of my work here is spent on trying to understand the genetics of disease transmission in animals, and in particular, trying to promote the idea of using selective breeding to reduce infectivity as an effective way to help combat disease. As part of this work, we've developed new individual-based Bayesian methods to analyze data from disease transmission experiments. However, it's important to note that these methods are typically applied to perhaps a few hundred animals or fish. And so prior to RAMP, we had not tackled anything on the same scale as COVID-19. The motivation behind this work is to develop accurate and robust mathematical models for COVID-19. These are not only useful to help understand the disease and its spread, but also have great practical importance. Their ability to look into the future and test possible control strategies before applying them in practice is key to determining what to do next. However, mathematical models are only useful if they are well parameterized. And when it comes to parameterization, Bayesian inference is the gold standard. This is because it can account for uncertainties in our prior knowledge and the data and outputs estimates for model parameters and system behavior, including uncertainty. So providing the best evidence-based advice which can be fed into public policy. Our aim therefore is to develop effective models and Bayesian methods to, par to parameterize those models using publicly available COVID-19 data. Ideally, these models should account for differences in disease severity, spatial variation, demographic variation, time variation in external force of infection, government interventions, human behavioral change, different virus variants, vaccination effects, biases in the data. Now that is a long list and spoiler alert, I should clarify that we have not been able so far to take into account all these effects simultaneously. If I look back at my experiences over the last two years, it feels more like being lost in a big city. At the start, we had grand ambitions, but didn't really know quite how to tackle the huge amounts of data coming from different sources with associated biases and a great deal of uncertainty about the disease itself. We started by trying to apply the individual based methods with which we were familiar. But whilst these work well for small populations, they were found to not be sufficiently computationally fast to be applied at a nationwide level. So that proved a dead end and we had to turn around and look for alternatives. ABC type approaches and particle MCMC seemed attractive, but they too were found to have their limitations. And so this, this led us to developing some new techniques, which I'll talk about later. So to give a brief overview of the talk, I'll start by outlining some existing methods in particular, ABC rejection sampling and ABC SMC. And then I'll go, go on to describe a new inference methodology called ABC MBP. I'll mention a software tool we've been developing called Beep MBP, and this will be used to perform a speed comparison for a number of inference algorithms using a set of benchmark models. Finally, I'll provide results for an age structured model of COVID-19 applied to England. To explain the various inference algorithms, I'm going to be using a simple SIR epidemiological model rather than the much more complicated COVID-19 model, which will be presented later. The SIR model assumes the population is divided into those which are susceptible S, those which are infected I, and those which have recovered R. Per capita infections occur at a rate given by parameter beta times the current fraction of infected individuals in the population who recover at a rate gamma. Such a model can easily be simulated from. Suppose we start with 1000 individuals 
one of which is initially infected. We select a suitable set of parameter values for beta and gamma. And the system dynamics can be simulated, in this case using the town leaping algorithm, which is a discrete time approximation to the Gillespie algorithm. Typical epidemic behaviour is observed, in which the number of infected individuals, denoted by the red curve, grows rapidly, depleting the susceptible population until herd immunity is realised, at which point the epidemic dies out. It is important to note that this system exhibits significant stochastic variability. So if the sim simulation is repeated with exactly the same initial conditions, different dynamic behaviour is observed. And sometimes no epidemic is observed at all due to epidemic extinction. Next, we consider collecting some hypothetical data from this system. In this example, the crosses represent measurements made on the infected and recovered populations. But it's important to remember that in other situations, data could consist of measurements on transition numbers, for example, weekly cases, hospitalizations, and deaths. Note, the crosses do not align precisely with the curves, and this reflects some error in the data collection process itself. To clarify the terminology we will be using, in the top right, we see that collectively, the model parameters are referred to as theta. The curves on the left, which denote the underlying system dynamics, sometimes called the state, are referred to as xi, and the data, denoted by the crosses, are referred to as y. Inference is the process by which we try to estimate the model parameters theta and true system behaviour psi based on whatever data y we happen to have. Obviously, theta and psi cannot be precisely known, but a probability distribution for these quantities given the data can be defined, and this is called the posterior. Application of Bayes' theorem implies that the posterior can be written as the product of an observation model, which measures how close the data is to some underlying dynamic state, a latent process likelihood, which tells us how likely the dynamic state is given a set of model parameters, and a prior, which captures any pre-existing estimates for model parameters. Next, we discuss contrasting approaches to tackling the observation model. Suppose we use some set of values for theta, not necessarily the correct ones, and we simulate a dynamic state psi from the model. The question we want to answer is, how do we measure the similarity between psi and the data, y? For clarity, let's just focus on looking at the infection curve and corresponding data. We denote the values of the data by lowercase y, indexed by an observation number, in this case going from 1 to 4. Corresponding values based on Xi are denoted by capital Y. Option 1 for the observation model is to assume that the difference between the lower and uppercase Ys is distributed according to some probability distribution which captures errors in the observation process. A very typical example is to use a normally distributed observation model where sigma i measures the expected error in the ith measurement. Other possibilities include Poisson or negative binomial probability distributions. A second option is to define the observation model through an error function. Many possibilities exist for defining such an error function, but one possibility is just to take the square of the difference between the data and xi and potentially weight depending on how accurate the observation is assumed to be. We see here that if the error function is zero, it means that the state psi precisely agrees with the data. And if it is large, this means that there is a big discrepancy between the two. In approximate Bayesian computation, or ABC for short, we assume that the observation model is non-zero only when the error function is below some specified threshold value, here denoted by EF cutoff. Based on the two approaches for the observation model, different sets of inference algorithm have been developed. Under option one, with the full probability distributions, we have data augmentation Markov chain Monte Carlo, Pascal MCMC, 
and Metropolis Capitals MCMC, among others. Under option two, which uses an error function, we have ABC rejection sampling, ABC SMC, and the new ABC MVP approach I'll discuss later. Due to limitations of time, I'm just going to focus on talking about those methods in option two. The first of these is the simplest, the ABC rejection sampling algorithm. First, we specify a prior, which in this case assumes a flat distribution over a plausible range of parameter values for beta and gamma. The first of these is the simplest, the ABC rejection sampling algorithm. First, we specify a prior, which in this case assumes a flat distribution over a plausible range of parameter values for beta and gamma. Step one involves sampling a parameter set from this prior. So in this case, the sampled values for beta and gamma are denoted by the vertical dashed gray lines. In step two, we simulate a state psi from the model using this parameter set. Next, we calculate the error function, which measures how far this state is from the data. Finally, if the error function is below the threshold EF cutoff, the sample is kept, otherwise, it is discarded. We repeat this process many times until we have accepted a sufficiently large number of samples. This shows an example posterior estimate when we set the error function threshold very high, 10 to the power of 6 in this case. The estimates for the model parameters on the right almost follow the prior distribution and the posterior estimates for the state on the left show very poor correspondence with the actual data points. As we reduce the error function cutoff to 10 to the power of 5, we see a marked improvement in these estimates. And subsequent reductions lead to both a very good agreement between the posterior samples and the data on the left and accurate estimates for the posterior parameter distributions on the right. Note, these distributions, shown in blue, are tightly bound around the true parameter values denoted by the vertical dashed lines, indicating that inference is able to accurately estimate these parameters, even with relatively few data points. It is worth noting, however, that here only 0.01% of samples are accepted using this procedure, highlighting the fact that this procedure can be extremely inefficient. To summarise this method, we see that it is good because it is very simple to implement, as we only need to be able to simulate from the model to get it to work. However, it becomes computationally very slow for small error function cutoffs, and this means it is not possible to get good posterior estimates for complex systems. Why is this? Well, it is largely due to the fact that most parameter samples from the prior have a very low posterior probability. Tackling this shortcoming is the motivation behind the next method I'll look at. ABC Sequential Monte Carlo, or ABC SMC for short, is run over several generations. For each generation, a different error function cutoff is used. This cutoff is successively reduced until the final generation, which is used for the eventual posterior samples. Generation 1, shown on the left, works in exactly the same way as the rejection algorithm described before. 1. A sample theta is taken from the prior. 2. A system stake psi is simulated. 3. The error function is calculated, and finally, 4, the sample is accepted if its error function is less than the cutoff for generation 1. As shown on the right, generation 2 and above differ in step 1 of the procedure. Rather than sampling from the prior, they use the parameters generated from the previous generation as an important sampler, which results in weights being attached to the samples that are generated. This shows an example of the ABC SMC algorithm applied to the same SIR data from before. Here we have four generations going from left to right. The first generation has a very large cutoff of 10 to the power of 6, and subsequent generations reduce this by a factor of 10. If we look at the estimated posterior distributions for the parameters beta on the top and gamma on the bottom, we find that for generation 1 on the left, they closely resemble the prior, but by the fourth generation on the right, they have converged to an accurate approximation of the true posterior. 
The real value of the ABC SMC approach is appreciated by looking at the lowest line, which shows the acceptance rate for the proposed samples. We see that whilst it does go down over generations of around 38% to around 10%, it is nowhere near as low as the 0.01% found for the basic ABC rejection sampling scheme, and so it is much more efficient. To summarise, ABC SMC is relatively simple to implement in that we just need to be able to simulate from the model, but it should be noted that there is some complexity in optimally and robustly choosing the error cutoff schedule over generations, details of which I've not gone into here. It is usually much faster than simple ABC rejection sampling, but it can still become slow for small error function cutoff. Why is this? Well, there is really two reasons. Firstly, if the system contains many parameters, perhaps more than around 10, then variation in importance weights can lead to a very small effective sample size, necessitating a large number of samples to be generated. Secondly, in situations in which stochasticity is important, even using the correct parameter set can lead to a poor probability of simulating the observed data. Next, we come to describing our new Bayesian methodology called ABC with model-based proposals, or ABC MBP for short. In the first step, we sample P sets of parameters from the prior to generate P so-called particles. In a typical analysis, the number of particles would be around 200, but for ease of illustration, we here show results for just 10 particles. For each of these particles, we start by simulating a state, psi p, from the model, and then calculate the corresponding error function. In step four, we set an error function cutoff in the first generation, such that half the particles are below this limit. These are shown by the highlighted red curves here, which lie closer to the data. These selected particles are then duplicated with the others being cobbled. Finally, model-based proposals are applied to allow particles to explore potential parameter and state space. It's this step which is the key novelty of the algorithm, and it is something that we'll come back to explain in detail later. So that completes the first generation. The same basic procedure is repeated over subsequent generations. So for example, in the second generation, we again calculate the error function select half of the particles which lie closer to the data, duplicate those and cull the rest, and then again apply model-based proposal transitions. We find that in the second generation, the parameter posterior approximations on the right-hand side have markedly improved compared with the first generation. And this gets more and more accurate over subsequent generations. This is generation three, this is generation four, is final generation 5, which here shows accurate posterior parameter distributions on the right, and states which fit the data well on the left. As mentioned before, one of the key novelties of the ABC MBP is the way in which the particles are able to efficiently move in parameter and state space using model-based proposals. This slide hints at how they work. In step 1, a proposed parameter set is sampled typically from a multivariate normal distribution. In step two, rather than simulating a new state, which is what would typically be done, the proposed state is actually modified from the existing state. This is where the magic really happens, because it turns out that, that for a wide range of distributions, it is possible to non-trivially derive procedures for this modification, such that the model is entirely accounted for. For example, Poisson distributions in the tau leaping algorithm map onto a mixture of Poisson and binomial distributions under this modification. Gamma distributions map onto a mixture of gamma and beta distributions, and so on and so forth. For those interested in more details, please see the paper at the bottom of the page, which was published a few years ago. In step three, the error function for the proposed state is calculated, and provided it is within the cutoff, the proposal is accepted with the probability given by the ratio in prior between the proposed and initial states. We have incorporated all the inference algorithms discussed here 
as well as some others, into a software tool called Bayesian Estimation of Epidemic Parameters Using Model Based Proposals, or BEEP MBP for short. This is an open source software tool for fitting epidemiological models and features a par parallel implementation suitable for HPC. It supports flexible model specification with potential spatial and demographic stratification, as well as a variety of different data types. To test the relative speed of different inference algorithms, we have set up a variety of benchmark models ranging in complexity from a simple SIR model to a more complex spatial SEIR model, which contains 10 geographical areas and time variation in the transmission rate. I don't have time to show all the results in detail, but the broad picture that emerges is as follows. This shows results for the simple SIR model. On the x-axis, we have a measure of the error function cutoff. When this is large on the right-hand side of this diagram, it corresponds to a poor approximation to the posterior. But as we travel left in this diagram, the estimate becomes increasingly good. On the y-axis, we have the CPU time. So lower down in this diagram is advantageous because it means that the algorithm has obtained an equivalently accurate posterior estimate in less time. The different curves show results for six different inference algorithms as indicated by the key. We see that the black dash curve for the standard ABC rejection algorithm performs the least well, with others performing at a similar level. However, if we look at results for a more complex model, a different picture emerges. Specifically, we find that ABC SMC, shown by the orange dash curve, actually performs the worst, followed by the standard ABC given by the black dash line, and then particle MCMC, shown by the dashed pink line, which is another widely used approach. Methods which use model-based proposals, given by the red and green lines, are found to be significantly faster at generating good posterior estimates for these sorts of complex models. Next, we look at applying a new ABC MBP methodology to analyzing COVID-19. This shows the compartmental model we use. In common with most models, it features asymptomatic as well as symptomatic states and hospitalized, recovered and dead compartments. It also features a T state for test sensitive individuals which are recovered and a C state for critically ill but isolating individuals, as these were found to be necessary to match the model to the data. This model was applied to England and the population was split into 18 age categories indexed by A, consisting of five year age bands plus a care home group. Time series data consisted of weekly cases, hospitalizations, deaths, and PCR and seroprevalence results from the COVID-19 infection survey, each of which informed different aspects of the model. The force of infection lambda gives the probability per unit time that an, indivi that an individual in age category A becomes infected at time T. This is dependent on an age contact matrix C and an external force of infection eta, which I'll talk about over the next two slides. The age contact matrix estimates the number of infected contacts an individual in one age group has with individuals in the same and different age groups. Usually this is estimated from survey data, such as the matrix depicted on the right taken from the BBC pandemic study. The effect of government interventions and changing social behaviour across the pandemic are incorporated through a time varying factor F, and potential shifts in the mixing between different age groups is incorporated by age modifying factors new. Both F and new are estimated from the data. COVID-19 enters the UK by individuals moving to and from other countries. We have made some estimate for this external force of infection, as shown by the red curve, using global flight data from the Civil Aviation Authority and global COVID-19 data from Johns Hopkins University. We clearly see three peaks which initiated the three infection waves experienced up until the end of summer in 2021. The model itself contains around 153 parameters which need to be estimated 
and the data consists of around 9,000 observations in total, spread across many time series. Inference was performed using ABC MBP on the Dirac HPC facility and took around five hours running on 256 cores. Next, I will briefly present some results. This graph shows the inferred variation in the effective reproduction number as a function of time. After an initial drop from the first lockdown, it varies above and below one, causing the three pandemic waves we have experienced so far. We were able to successfully obtain a fully parameterized age structured model. This includes age variation in the asymptomatic infection probability in the top left, the probability of going to hospital once infected in the top right, and the probability of hospitalized death in the bottom left. The bottom right shows the differences in time individuals in different age categories are test sensitive for. Finally, when we look at the pattern of relative mixing between different age groups, as characterized by the factors new, we find it significantly differs from what would have been expected based on the BBC pandemic study. In particular, we find higher relative rates of effective contact in younger individuals compared to older individuals. In summary, we have developed a new inference methodology, ABC MBP, which is significantly faster than existing approaches. This approach is generic and not specific to COVID-19 or, for that matter, epidemiology. We have created a software tool, BEEP MBP, which incorporates many inference algorithms and is flexible to different model specifications and data types. Finally, we have applied this new methodology to data from England and obtained a fully parameterized age structured model. Looking to the future, COVID-19 provides a huge data source which will be poured over for many years with many opportunities for new ways of analysis. We are currently working on spatial models trying to assess the impact of government interventions and travel restrictions and also adapting what we have learned from COVID-19 modelling to help us to be more prepared for the next animal disease outbreak. Lastly, the crucial question remains, what should we do differently next time? I would like to thank my co-authors Andrea Wilson and Glenn Marion for their big contributions to this work and also a large number of people, including those in the Scottish COVID-19 Response Consortium, the RSEs who helped with improving the code, the data curators, and finally, the funders who helped make this research possible. Thank you very much for your time, and I will be happy to answer any questions.